We want to welcome everybody this evening. May tonight and the weekend festivities be full of fun, memories, and things that you can talk about for ages and ages. Welcome everyone again.
opportunity to give recognition to the seniors for accomplishments that they have achieved. Not only is it a verbal opportunity, it is a visual one as well. These cords signify specific accomplishments and we are very delighted and honored to present them to you. Those seniors who have been in attendance at Midland Adventist Academy for the past four years will be receiving black cords. Those seniors who have been able to maintain a cumulative GPA of 3.0 to 3.49 will be receiving white cords. Those seniors who have been able to maintain a cumulative GPA of 3.5 to 3.74 will be receiving silver cords. And the seniors who have maintained highest honors, 3.75 to 4.0, will be presented with gold cords. Seniors, as Mrs. Fairchild reads your names, I invite you to come and receive your cords. Rebecca Bourne, four years senior. <laughs> Karina Bovee, four years senior.
And I also want to say a special thank you to the Bobies. Um, it's, it's been an honor. Again, <laughs> try not to get too emotional there. Um, it really is. I didn't think I would be working with you again either. And uh, it, it was nice. You know, one of the things about the Adventist system, when you run into somebody, that's not the end. You do see them again. So uh, while you're graduating from Midland, you're also going to be seeing a lot of these people again at alumni weekends and uh, at your local churches when you come back to visit and all kinds of other places in the future. So we create a family. And I just want to say it has been a joy to get to know each and every one of you. Um, some of you I wish I could have gotten to know better. And uh, I look forward to seeing what God does in and through you. Um, I do want to just point something out in your program. If you would take a look at the, uh, the, the brains behind this class and where they're going on uh, what's the last page, if you turn it back open, we have a aim, motto, and verse. If you take a look at this, this lets you into some of the insights of this class. Their aim is to allow God to put us where we belong. That's a good aim for everybody. Their motto, we don't know what the future holds, amen, but we know who holds the future. And their verse is, well, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for uh, the last three years of getting to know these young people seeing them grow from little sophomores to uh, becoming here seniors, graduating, moving on with life. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to get to know them. And as we celebrate their years here at Midland this weekend, uh, we just pray a special blessing on them as they move forward. And the words that I have to speak, may they come from you. In Jesus' name. I want to tell you a story about Abraham. Uh, Abraham is actually one of my favorite characters in the Bible. If you had your Bibles, and I know you have phones that have Bibles, but it's not the same. If you had your Bibles, and if you were to turn to the book of Genesis, chapter 12, you would find the beginning of a story of a man who, we know him as Abraham, but at this point in his story, he's, he's just beginning. He's, he's what we would call a heathen. Uh, he is a non-follower of Yahweh, the God that later became the God of the Hebrew people, the Israelites. Abram was his name in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. The Lord said to Abram, go from your country, go from your people, from your father's household, to the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. And all peoples from all the earth will be blessed through you. It's a fitting story for this class, I would say. Uh, when we take a look at Abraham's story here, just in the very beginnings of his existence, just pay attention to some details about Abraham's life. Just in that verse uh, 1 through 4 alone of chapter 12, this meant a complete and total separation of everything Abraham had ever known. He was living with his father. He was in a country that he knew. He was with family and friends. He probably had a career. He probably had everything going for him. And God comes to him in the night and says, leave that. You know those fertile grazing lands that you're so used to? Leave that. You, you know the heavily wooded, nice, mountainous country that you're, that you're so acquainted with? Walk away from it. And added to that, I'm not even going to tell you where you're going. In fact, as you're going, just start going, and I'll tell you when you get there. Take it step at a time, and if I say stop, this will be it. You had no idea where you were going to end up if you were Abraham in this story. He leaves everything that he knew, and yet there at the end of chapter 12, verse 5, he says, So Abraham went as the Lord had told him, blindly following God wherever God would go. Now, I've never had God speak directly to me in a, in a go here and do this type of way, um, but I imagine if I had God speak to me in that, I might be, uh, two responses, one might be fear and thinking that I've lost my mind, and the other response might be, well, if he took the time to come down here and tell me it must be important, so I must just do it, right? Um, Abraham goes, and I've always kind of wondered about that, why he just left everything that was familiar. Do, do I have the courage to leave 
everything that's familiar and go on some journey to some unknown land? Do, do you as seniors have the courage to walk out these doors Sunday morning to be adults in the real world? I put air quotes on that. You know, it's not your parents. They're still your kids. Uh, but they're going to go out and they're going to be adults and they're going to have to be courageous. They're going to have to make decisions on their own. They're going to have to do all kinds of adult type decisions in life. Do you have the courage to walk away from everything that's been safe for these last 12 years of high school? Four years of high school. 12 years of middle. 12 years of being a student. Do you have what it takes to walk away from everything that you've ever known to the safety of home and family and go to some place that God hasn't even told you where you're going yet? You may have plans for college. I bet that'll change. You may have plans for a degree and a major. I bet that'll change. You may have plans for a spouse. I bet that'll change. As we follow Abraham's story, continuing on in chapter uh, 12, verse 10, he, the first thing he encounters is what? Famine. In verse 10 it says famine came to the land. This place that God was leading him to, and he finally gets there, and he stops. What does he find? Famine. If you were Abraham in this story, you might think, why did you lead me from everything that I had, all the safety, all the food that I had, to this place that has no food. You might think, that's rude. As we follow the story along, verse uh, 11 through 20, uh, Abraham is now tested with faithfulness, being faithful to his own wife. He ends up in Egypt at one point to avoid the famine. The place that God sent him to was in famine, so he goes down to Egypt to get away from the famine. Again, taking his own path, didn't stay where God said to think about. He goes down to Egypt, and then all of a sudden, the pharaoh is into his wife, and he has to decide, is this going to be my wife or my sister? Well, technically, he was able to be safe there because it was technically his half-sister. So he wasn't necessarily lying when he said, this is my sister, but that's a different sermon. So as he comes into this story, he's tested with, wow, now I've got famine, and I have to know if God's going to take care of me. And then, not only that, I have to decide if I'm going to be faithful to what God has told me, to be honest, to be faithful to my wife, to be faithful to what he's called me to be. Chapter 13, verse 2, he's challenged with fortunes. It says in uh, 13, verse 2, that Abraham had become very wealthy. He had become rich in livestock, silver, and gold. Riches are a mixed blessing. You could find yourself, after you graduate, off making tons of money, having lots of livestock. What are you going to do with that? Are you going to be faithful to God and give your tithe? Are you going to be a, a generous person with people less fortunate than you? Are you going to use that money to do good? Or are you going to use that money to, to stock up piles of stuff? Abraham was challenged with famine. He was challenged with faithfulness. He was challenged with fortunes. Verse 8 of chapter 13, he was also challenged with fractured relationships. If you follow the story of Abraham, he also had a nephew named Lot. Lot was his brother's son. And as Lot made his own choices, he left Abraham, took his flock, and went to a different place. Not a very good place, actually. And Abraham had this broken relationship with his own family. He did get him back. But I wonder how much damage was done. Famine, faithfulness, fortunes, fractured relationships. And then finally, chapter 15, verse 5, Abraham was promised family. And maybe one of the biggest tests of Abraham's life was to say, am I going to trust that God is actually going to provide me with a son, or am I going to do it my own way, forge my own path, and have one with her? A secondary lady on the side, who ended up causing a lot of mess for the children of Israel later down the line. Abraham's experience, he was tested with famine, faithfulness, fortunes, fractured relationships, and family. And now Abraham's story, we all know how it ends up. I won't get into the details of that. But throughout Abraham's story alone, ten times God says, follow me and I will make you great. Follow me, do what I say, do it my way, and you'll be okay. I think this is a great lesson for us today. God fulfilled his promises to the children of Israel as they grew as a nation. Um, in perhaps one of their lowest points in their nation's history in the book of Jeremiah, God finally comes to the prophet Jeremiah in a message to the people to encourage them at perhaps one of their lowest points. God comes to Jeremiah and says in chapter 29, 11, we all know it. I'll show up, God says. I'll show up and I'll take care of you as I promised all along. I'll bring you back home. I know what I'm doing, God said to Jeremiah. 
I have it all planned out. Plans to take care of you, not to abandon you. Plans to give you a future, a future that you hope for. And when you call on me, when you come and pray to me, I'll listen. And when you come looking for me, you'll find me. I'll make sure you won't be disappointed. I'll make sure that things turn out right. God speaks to the children of Israel in one of their darkest moments in history as their slaves, essentially. And he says, I know what you're going through. I know where you've come from, and I know where you're going, and I'm going to take care of you just the same. And I believe that God looks at each and every one of your lives and says the exact same thing. I think he looks into the experiences that your families have gone through. He looks into the grades that you maybe could have done better in. And he looks at your lives and he says, I can do something with that, if you let me. So, throughout Abraham's story, he was challenged with a number of things that we all go through today. The challenge of trusting God to be there when we need Him, or to hope that things will work out on our own. Will we trust God or do it our way? You know, when I was uh, probably, I don't know, I, I want to say that I was six years old. I may have been closer to 10 or 15. But I'll say six. When I was six years old, um, we, we used to go to this park, and this park had this pond. And this pond was a really fun pond. We used to go there as kids on Sabbath afternoons. We would take bread, big old sleeve of bread. We'd take pieces, and we'd throw them out into this little duck pond. And the ducks would swim over really quick, and they'd peck at the bread, and they'd eat it all nice and soggy. And it was a fun thing for me as a, as a six-year-old kid to, um, to do this because I thought I was really good at throwing bread. You know, it's a light thing, it doesn't take a whole lot, but if you wad it up real good, it's hard, and you can throw it farther. And so I used to try and throw it far, and I would get these ducks so mad, I think they're mad. How do you know when a duck's mad? Anyways, I would get the ducks mad, I'd throw it way out there, and they'd go out, and we'd be like, go long, duck, and I'd throw it, and the ducks would swim way out, and their little feet make a little weight behind them, little feather scheme behind them. Anyways, so I would throw it right to that spot behind the duck's head that they could never get to, as they would turn. You know that spot? Have you done that? Some of you have done it. I know you've done it. Okay, so anyways, I was out there with my family one Sabbath afternoon after church, and I was wearing this shirt that I loved. Do you remember the, the show Star Wars? Ever heard of that? Okay, so there's, there's, a, there's a thing that's called a droid. It's about that big. It's, it's blue and white. Do you know what I'm talking about? little R2-D2 kind of thing. Do you know, have you seen that? Do you know, nobody's heard of it. Okay, so R2-D2 was a robot, and I loved Star Wars. I was one of those kids. And, um, and my brother was in the hospital quite a bit when, when I was a kid, and they used to have this hospital robot that would roll around. It was the same as R2-D2, but his name was not R2-D2. He was red, so it was different. But this one's name was U B O K. the U B O K. And this little robot would go down the halls, and he would go into the rooms, and he would check in on the, the kids that are sick, and he would encourage them. This little guy with a remote control was really what it was. And he had a little microphone, and he was speaking into this thing. And he would speak encouragement to the kids that were sick. And I just thought that was the coolest thing for a hospital to do for their patients. And uh, anyways, I had a t-shirt that said, you'd be okay, and had a picture of him. And I was like, this is my favorite shirt ever. I'm going to wear it for the rest of my life. And it was my absolute favorite thing that a six-year-old kid could own. And I was wearing it that day, and I had my nice blue jeans, I had my sneakers, and I had my UBOK okay shirt, and I'm like throwing red like I've never thrown it before. And then something happened. Something different happened. This time when I threw it, I lost my balance, and I fell into the water. And I was falling like 15, 20, 35 feet down into, it was like four. Um, but I was small, so it felt farther. But when I hit the water, fresh, and I fell down, and I was like sinking, and I remember everything slowed down, and I was in this gross, disgusting water. If you've ever been to Topeka Gate Park, it's gross. Um, so I was in that pond, and I was sinking down, and I saw all of this green algae stuff and fish swimming around, and, and, I, and I hit the bottom, and I was laying there like, well, this is how I die. <laughs> I was dramatic. Um, and I'm laying there, and I'm, and I'm thinking, death is coming. And I see fish swimming around, waiting to take bites out of me. And, and I'm laying on the bottom, just waiting it out, waiting it out. And then I see my brother comes up to the edge. And he goes like this, and he waves my, my dad and my mom over, and, and he starts laughing, and he pokes, right? He's laughing, great help, my brother. And, and I'm laying on the bottom thinking, thanks, jerk. And then, and then my mom comes up, and she's got this look on her face like, oh, what do we do? 
And, and then my dad, all of a sudden, his hand shifts down. He grabs my shirt. He pulls me up. He stands me down and goes, you okay? That was awesome. <laughs> and, and I'm standing there crying, not because I almost died, but quite honestly, why I was crying as a six-year-old, um, laying there, um, dripping wet. I was more upset because my t-shirt had got ruined. Uh, it was all green and algae, and we had to throw it away, and I was really bummed. But the point is, you may find yourselves graduating from high school. You may go off into the world, and you might find yourself being faced with all kinds of things that you've never expected to encounter before. You might find yourself needing to take a break from your past. You might find yourself being called to something new in a foreign place, perhaps a college that you didn't expect to go to. You might find yourself drowning in a pond of life, looking up while people are standing around laughing at you. You might be overwhelmed with life, but God will be there. God will reach into your life. He will stand you up. He knows what he's doing. He will not abandon you. When you call on him, he will listen and he will be there. And when you look for him with all your heart, you will find him. He'll reach into your pain, into your loneliness, into your uncertainty, into your fears, into bad grades and unemployment, family problems and ruin. And he'll take a hold of your life. And he'll stand you up. He'll brush you off and say, yeah, you hurt your shirt. But you're still mine. And I still got it. Your text, Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest. We don't give up. My prayer is that you won't give up. That when life happens, when you're out there on your own, that you'll remember the story of Abraham. And that you'll remember that you have a God who loves you. You have a family who supports you and is here to protect you. And we're just a call away. supposed to call the pastors up. If you're a pastor, please come up. Not necessarily just Kansas, Nebraska, but if you're Iowa, Missouri, we like you too. Um, if you're from around, if you're a pastor, if you've done pastorly duties, we want to have you come up and have a prayer over the seniors. So if you're a pastor, please come forward.